Hi, Mike Zipser here, and with me in the studio is Charles Gannon, whose latest book is Raising Cain, the third book in the Cain Riordan trilogy out from Bain. Charles, welcome back to the show. Mike, it's great to be back. Yeah, so this is book three it of is. what is now being called the Cain Riordan trilogy. That Well, not trilogy would certainly well, not be trilogy, a misnomer. But That's the, where we yeah. are thus far, yeah. Yeah, how many books do you anticipate in this series? Uh, yeah, uh, you don't. <laughs> I, I, yeah, exactly, exactly. There could be, there could be, that is, at, uh, that is largely going to be determined by what Tony Weisskopf and the buying public wants, but uh, I don't have a, uh, I don't have a short list for this one. I've yeah. got a lot of story here. And Tony Weisskopf is your editor at Bain. Uh, yep, exactly. And one of the best in the field. Certainly, I think so. <laughs> and they take Bain takes very good care of their authors. Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, and it's a house that has a lot of um, a lot of. It can take a lot of a lot of risks. It has a little bit less consultation. It's not you know owned by a large you know mega corporate entity. So um, so one of the best things, frankly, in in my experience, is that. When Tony says, I want to buy that book, if she, she says that to you, you do business on a handshake. And that's pretty rare any place. Uh, and in the entertainment business, in my experience, having been in television and publishing both, that's damn near unique. So, Yeah, Tony, Tony's great. I, I know her, I like her. Mm. Um, so there's a lot of surprises in, in these books. Things change quickly. You learn new things. How much of that... Did you, do you have planned out, and do you ever get surprised by the characters as you're writing it? Um, I, I'd love at this moment to probably be able to say, yes, I get shocked, and oh, no, it all comes. I, I'd feel like a much more creative, you know, <laughs> inspired person at that point. But uh, while it's certainly not mechanistic in terms of the way I sort of set down and... and, and uh, put it together, uh, what basically happens is long before I start writing the book, I'm thinking about the book, I'm thinking about the ideas that are going to be in the book, and as those ideas start coming out, they start sort of knocking into each other, and I say, oh, wouldn't this be cool if, oh, that's where the surprises happen. Then I'll get surprises sort of moment to moment. Uh, characters may reveal things to me about themselves, uh, so I guess you could say I, I really have a pretty good outline and a sense of where the plot twists are going to be and what I'm going to show, what's going to happen on stage, what's going to happen off stage. But in the moment, that's where I sort of leave, I guess you could say, a maximum amount of inspiration because I think that's where we detect if something is, if, if the prose gets turgid, uh, that's where it's, it's largely going to happen in, in sort of wooden dialogue and all the rest. So I don't, I don't plot dialogue ahead of time and I don't plot the, the nuances of interaction. Speaking of that, one of the things I found interesting in this is the way the character of Etienne Gaspard um, kind of changes in this book. Because beforehand, he's kind of the a-hole. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there have been many, many uh, single-syllable, largely <laughs> Anglo-Saxon words used to describe Etienne Gaspard, who we meet in the first book. Mm -hmm. We see briefly in the second book as well. And uh, pretty much described by words such as prig, martinet, uh, popinjay, et cetera, et cetera. Um, a very, very particular old school uh, Sorbon diplomat, which is sort of a dying, a di to, to this day, a little bit a fading breed, but here probably the last of his ilk. Um, and he is held out as a kind of, I guess you would say, annoying character. But as, absolutely, and it was my intent. Um, Human beings, in, in my experience, you can meet some people who really tick you off. Uh, over time, most human beings will do one of two things. They'll show you that, that is, there's more to them than that, or they have better than average reasons for perhaps behaving that way at certain times. Doesn't mean it's okay, doesn't mean we would do it, or th that we would consider it ethically or morally acceptable for ourselves, but understanding increases over time. And I would, I would, uh, I feel very secure in saying, we understand a little bit more about what drives him and why what he does, he's not a villain in his own mind. And, and I think by the end of the book, certainly he's never a villain, but he's no longer a pain, pain in the A. And, yeah, I mean, and, and he's, you, you find out he's really competent at his job. Mm. Yeah. Which is, goes a long way, particularly in, in, in the world of Kane Riordan. If you're good at what you do, that means a lot. 
It does. It does. Absolutely. And they're in, a, they're in an environment throughout most of these books where you don't really get a whole lot of... You may get the luxury of making one mistake, but uh, if, you, if you think back to one of the models for this, which is uh, um, since, it's, since it's a citizen-soldier war that they've just come off of, and since Earth itself was in peril, um, you're, this is, these, are not, these are not proxy wars. These are not bush wars. This is not domino theory. This is not asymmetry a continent and a half away. This is in your doorstep, and if you really screw up, uh, you could be dancing to somebody else's or something else's tune. So the stakes are consistently high, and, and fast competence is, is yeah, it's uh, inescapably um, uh, prevalent and important here. And I think a lot of people sometimes read that and they say, oh, you know, golden era science fiction, it's, it's cranky and it's, it's clunky and it's creaky. And my, my take on it is I think our modern science fiction very much reflects the proxy levels of our age. Uh, we do a lot of things at arm's length. Uh, we're very careful to make sure that we, we don't have to, you know, gamble the, the, the farm on any, on any given bid. But they have moved into a model that is more like the World War I or World War II models, the great state war models, where actually you make a big enough mistake, uh, the repercussions can be disastrous. And that changes the ethos and the attitudes of the characters. So I would tend to say that I really don't give a darn about golden age or not golden age. What I'm concerned with is having re character reactions and concerns that are realistic to the historical moment, the future historical moment they occupy. Yes, and in your future history, I noticed there throughout the books how much um, plurality there is, how much diversity, how the characters, you know, sexual diversity, racial diversity, countries, and there's good and bad in all the alien races too, for the well, with some exceptions. <laughs> Yeah, sometimes you have to mine a little harder than <laughs> others to find the good, I suppose, right? Yeah, and I found that really interesting about the future world mm -hmm. that, that you propose here. Um, I also enjoy the fact that there's a lot of the old crew that Kane fought with and worked with at, in the second book are still with him as we start out this third one. Yes, um, and there's a bunch of reasons for that which are anything but chance. Uh, when you're working in, so for folks who may not be that familiar with the series at all, uh, we have in the first book essentially a first contact which goes well until it leads to a sort of broader first contact with, with the, the fairly sparse number of neighbors we have and then that second contact doesn't go so well, it goes so not so well that actually some uh, forces take it upon themselves to essentially uh, uh, essentially try to take control of Earth. Uh, they fail. Um, and now in, in this third book we have one of those, one of the, the I guess you could say friendly or amicable species uh, essentially extending an invitation to come see who we are. Don't make any decisions about whether you want to work with us until we've sort of you know, we're, this this is a first date. This is not a proposal, um, and and pursuant to all that, the the notion of a crew coming along with him is connected to the fact that when you think about it, in the course of this book, which the first scene I think in the first book begins, well, let's say the, leaving aside one uh, f uh, um, uh, prologue, is essentially 2018. By the time we're done with this book, I think we're in 2021, if I'm not mistaken. In those four years, we've gone from thinking we were alone in the universe to having a first contact, to repelling an attempt, a, a, a marginal and attempted invasion, and then reaching out and trying to find allies to make sure that, you know, uh, invasion redu does not occur. Um, classification is a major issue. In other words, Ken Riordan has been, by design, sort of by mistake and then by design, first contact for almost all the different groups. He's either been the single person or one of the ten people who've been meeting these people first. Well, when you think about that from the intelligence perspective, you're going to have the people who are around him have already been vetted. You don't add a lot of new people in there and sometimes when you're sort of, a lot of what's going on here is, as we saw for instance in World War II, 
Um, you may have all sorts of plans, but a lot of the game is still pickup. It's a come-as-you-are party when you get caught flat-footed by what the other person is doing. And so what happens? Well, the people that are already with you, that know you, that work with you, that have the clearance to work with you, that have the clearance to hear the things you're going to say and talk about because you've had first contact, um, it's going to tend to recycle a lot of the same. That all said, so that's the realistic. I also really sort of like the notion of um, what if this was, uh, to, to change the title a little bit, Band of Brothers and Sisters. You know, there's something about that ethos that I really like that sort of flows along with that World War II ethos, no shock. Um, and, uh, and I wanted that, that in there as well. So it's, it's, it, it's, from my standpoint, it was a great narrative structure. And it was fun. And, and, was, and <laughs> it was fun and also had, it was quite plausible given what I know about the intelligence community. Right. Now you mentioned the other alien races. And one of the things I like about these books is I think it's some of the best aliens around. They are alien. They're definitely not human. They're hmm. still relatable. Uh, how do you go about developing your alien races? Do they start with, I need a race that is like this, how would that be? Or do you look at, well, what kinds of things could evolve an intelligent race? More the latter. Um, I, there was one group in here that I guess you could say, uh, Usually I almost run this more like a simulation, and I think that the latter is more of a simulation sort of approach, which is I'm not going to give in to the temptation to say what would be perfect for me as a narrative foil. I think, you, I think readers can smell that. Mm -hmm. uh, I know I can usually feel, uh, oh, you're setting me up. Oh, it's going to be a hidden discourse about this. Oh, please. I'm smarter than that. And all you guys are smart, and gals are smarter than that. So... So, so there's a, a real approach to an almost a, a simulation kind of aspect. And what that has me do, therefore, is I sit down and I'll think about where can a creature evolve. Um, I, I could have gone perhaps even more anthropomorphic than I did. Uh, one is completely non-anthropomorphic. One, two, three are bipedal. But the only, there are actually reasons for that, and and um, a lot of it. I this is the moment when, in our last interview, I would have gone off on a tangent. I'm not going to go there. You're just going to have to have me back a third time if you yes. want to find out about that. Um, but uh, but what I'll do is I'll say, okay, so we think of a thing that looks like a bug. Would it necessarily be a bug? And so I come up with the Aratkur, which on, the, on many of their surface gross anatomical features, they would look like a large arthropod, large in the sense of about as big as a sizable coffee table, um, and, uh, you know, and, and quite unprepossessing to our eye. On the other hand, as we find in the second book, in a lot of ways, they are, the real, they are far less aggressive than humans are. But there's a history, and there's, an issue, there's a set of issues, and uh, they, are, they are, I guess you could say, uh, both sort of pushed and pulled into the adversarial relationship they find themselves with in, in regard to humanity. But, so, so I've decided I have this arthropod that developed intelligence. Well, first question I ask myself is how? How the heck did that happen? Where would they live? Um, and I'm a real b big believer that form follows function. Um, and so if they're if they're an insect then, or they're insect-like, where are they? They're probably not going to have highly developed ocular features. For a large creature above ground, not so good. Underground, not so important. If then what I start saying is, oh, yeah, but their infrared might be very good. And their ability to use sound and echolocation. In, so I come up with a subterranean creature. Well, subterranean creatures, all sorts of features begin to suggest themselves. But that's the moment when I come to what I would consider to be the, the sort of lock and key mechanism of how I make the aliens alien, n but not because I try to. I know that's going to sound strange, but, but it's about what I would call the, the dawn of intelligence story. Uh, to put it in context that probably all our viewers will know, uh, the first scene, or the first, if you will, part of 2001 is the story of the proto-humans who are just, they're pushed to the wall. They're being hunted out of, this one group uh, is being hunted out of, you know, out of existence. Another proto-human group has pushed them away from a, a, a water hole. Things are looking very poor. And then, you know, the, the, the inspiration to see a bone not as 
detritus of a dead animal but a tool you know, occurs to one of them and suddenly the tune becomes the way to hunt and kill food, to fight the other ones off from the, from the, uh, the water hole, to drive off the predators. And to me, that tells us something about human evolution. It tells us about our relationship to tools, about where we use them, how we use them. And, and certainly Stanley Kubrick in 2001 uses it because what a lot of folks may not be aware of if you haven't read the book is that when, when Moonwalker, the name of the, the sort of lead proto-human, throws the bone in the air, there's a wonderful smash cut to a floating cylindrical object. That is actually an, an, IC, that is an orbital ICBM. So in other words, we go from the first weapon to potentially the last weapon in one massive context setting cut for us. Um, can you tell I made film for a while? Uh, <laughs> but the, but the, so, so to me, that gives me a sense of who we are. So then I start asking questions, well, what about, in this case, the Arat Kur? What is it that they did? Well, they're subterranean. They're not fast. They're awful hard to get to, but do they get enough sustenance down there? Maybe not. Uh, certainly not early on. But what are they going to come across? Well, any, any creature that falls down a hole is potentially food. But there probably won't be enough of that happening. However, it becomes very tempting to say, I, I wonder if we could make that happen. Do they become trappers? It, for, for them, if you will, is the deadfall pit and the impalement spike the first tool, not the club. And that leads to other weapons. Before we run out of time... Uh, How far in are we? We're almost done. Oh my gosh, okay, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Time flies. It does indeed. Um, talk, let's talk a little bit about what you've got coming up. You've got another Ken Riordan book, there, you got book in some of your uh, shared worlds. Mm -hmm. So really quickly, right now I'm working on the next book in this series, which is called Kane's Mutiny. Um, as you might be able to infer from the title, uh, many of his already not so comfortable relationships become uh, far more uncomfortable, as the English would say, they go pear-shaped. Uh, the book after that is uh, entitled Mark of Cain, where Mark is M-A-R-Q-U-E. So those of you who know what a letter of Mark was can probably infer just how far things go down from there. Um, there are two 1632 books that I'll be working on very soon. I uh, just signed a, uh, a contract for a, an epic fantasy trilogy with Bain, which will actually, as the series progress, uh, probably have a little bit of science fantasy elements in it. And, uh, and there's other stuff as well, but uh, if we have time for one more question, I'll, I'll stop there. I think that's a, we're about out of time. Okay. Thank you so much for coming by. I hope you come back again sometime. Oh, I'd love to. Always Great. enjoy it here. Thanks a lot. Thanks so much for having me. Well, that's it for this episode of Fast Forward. So from all of us here, this is Mike Zipser saying, take care. <laughs>